let's uh, let's turn to Matthew chapter nine. I want to read verses thirty-five to thirty-eight. Matthew chapter nine, verse thirty-five to thirty-eight. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Praise God. So this is a verse we often hear about and talk about and is used in the context of missions. But I want to start a few verses ahead of that where we started in verse 35. This is talking about how Jesus, uh, as he was going from city to city and villages, and he went to their synagogues, and he was preaching uh, the kingdom of God, right? And as the word of his ministry spread, people came to him with their many needs. And, as, and nowhere in the gospel I have found that anybody who came to Jesus did not receive an answer to their prayer, uh, their request. Uh, some, as you might know, as you remember, had to kind of press him, like the Canaanite woman, uh, for an answer, right? There's, I'm not going to go into that. There might be reasons for that. But the point I'm trying to make is that he healed, as it says here, every sickness and every disease among the people. There is nowhere in the gospel that I'm able to find, you might find it and correct me later, which is totally fine, um, that Jesus healed every single sickness and disease that they, he was confronted with. But why does the following verse say, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. If if they received the answer to the prayer that they were having in their heart, if they received an answer to the need that troubled them, many of them were healed. Uh, you know, there, were, there was a man who was healed, uh, who was paralyzed from, for, uh, for 38 years. There were people who were born blind that were healed. There were people who were possessed with devils. There were even people raised from the dead. If all those people met their needs, why did Jesus have compassion on them? Why did he feel as though that was not all they needed? Now, what is compassion? If you look at, if you just look at the root word, it's a long uh, Greek word. Um, I'm not going to repeat it because I'm going to uh, botch it up. But what it means is that your it's 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 a feeling of your bowels, your insides being consumed by or moved by feelings of pity and love towards somebody. That within the core of you, that you have been so moved that you have pity and love to to somebody. That is compassion. That is the feeling that Jesus had at that moment when he saw the multitude. And as we saw the picture here, he looked at them as they were these sheep. Now, by sheep, by nature, they need to be led. They need a leadership that will direct them in the right path. Otherwise, they're going to be scattered and they will not know what to do. So... As he saw these people, he saw them as sheep that no, uh, and no attachment to an everlasting kingdom. And that's where he had compassion on. And that's where we ourselves, as we think about missions, that's the place from which we should approach missions. Is Are we moved with the compassion that Jesus had 
when we see the harvest that is before us. And, and we might ask ourselves, okay, so Jesus said this 2,000 years ago. Are the needs now met? Are, is the harvest now been reaped? Aren't there enough people in the kingdom of God so that what is the big deal? Why do we keep need to harping on missions? And this is the question that we have to ask ourselves. Are we satisfied with the condition of the, pe uh, the people around us or the people that have put, uh, God has put in touch with our lives? So as we think about this, we have to really remember where we came from. Okay? When we think about this, um, and I am so joyed when I, when I heard the second Malayalam song because this is exactly what I was going to next. Uh, so if you turn to Psalm 40. I'm going to read the first three verses. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God, and many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. This is a song we sang, that I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined his ear unto me and heard my cry. When we look back to what God did for us, when we re remember where we came from, when we were in the pit of sin and headed to destruction, when we realized what God had done for us and pulled us out of that situation and washed us with his own precious blood and set our feet upon a rock, when we see people with those eyes, that's when we would be moved with compassion. When our bowels would be overflowed with love and pity to those who do not know Jesus yet. And that's what our call to missions should be. Is as we sang. Actually, it should be He washed us with His own precious blood when we have no claim to be part of the kingdom of God. We were not worthy to be His in this service. We were not worthy to call upon His name because we were in that horrible pit. And when we remember that, when we look back to that, we cannot but be moved with compassion to the harvest that is around us. Then we will not think, oh, what is the big deal about missions? We will not be complacent about the needs around us of those who do not know Jesus yet. So this is more than a physical satisfaction of the physical needs that people around us, that absolutely we should do that, right? We should, that's why James says, if you, uh, if you see a person that is in need and you send them away hungry, what is the point of preaching to them? We should fulfill those needs. But at the same time, do we have the compassion that Jesus moved, was moved with when he saw the multitude and they saw that they have no shepherd, they're scattered and they fainted and they have no strength because they are in the horrible pit of sin. Isn't it time the, we rise up and awake out of our slumber and rise up to the challenge of missions and ask God, what will you have me do? And notice I said, have me do and not have me give. And I, as I said, I, I am not uh, ungrateful for the giving that our church does. And I'm not ungrateful or unmindful of the heart that our church has in giving abundantly or, uh, you, know, uh, you know, participating in mission events and all those things. Absolutely. But we as a community, and I'm not talking just about the Malayali community, in the Western church, 
Isn't it time we awake to ask God, is it just enough for me to give? Shouldn't I go, is the question. How many of us are ready to answer the challenge of God, where can I go? You have given me enough. You've given me the resources. You've given me a family and, and, and wealth and children. But those are all rubbish, as Paul said, because I, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, I count it all as rubbish. Because, God, I want to know where I should go. Just like Isaiah, when he went uh, out the, uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, uh, in the year King Uzziah died, he, he saw God high and lifted up on the throne and the, uh, the, the whole uh, uh, the throne room was filled with smoke and he saw the seraphims praising him and he realized who he was just like this Psalm 40 is saying he realized who he was and he said I am a woe unto me I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips and suddenly one of the seraphims took a live coal and placed it upon his lips and said, you are now cleansed and your sins are purged. Aren't our sins purged? And didn't he wash us with his blood? And now we are standing upon the rock that is Christ. Is it so that we can enjoy all the, uh, the pleasures of this country? Or is it so that we can go and pull others out of the fire? As it says in the epistle of Jude. Pull them out of the fire. And have compassion on the harvest that is before us. Isn't it time that we encourage our children to step out into missions? Instead of uh, pursuing a lucrative career, isn't it time we tell them, it is, you need to give your life to Christ and, and go to missions. Are we willing to do that? This is a call to missions. Absolutely give your money uh, to the ministry that we support. But let's move from giving to going. I know this is a tough message, and I'm preaching to myself too. But are we willing to pray that prayer? Are you bold enough to pray that prayer? To go from giving to going. Because we feel so good when we give, and we feel that's sufficient. But maybe God is asking the best from you. The best of your years, the best of your children. Are you willing to go? This is a call to missions. And what was Jesus seeing when he saw the multitude at that time? I'm imagining this. He might have immediately seen a flash forward to another scene of another multitude in Revelation chapter 5. And I'll encourage the worship team to come up as I'm reading this. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts... And four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. They sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongues, and people, and nations. And thou hast made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Notice the key words there. This is what I was pointing to in Psalm 40. The same thing that says in Psalm 40, that you have redeemed us to God. That means he pulled us out of the clutches of the enemy. Redeemed means that if somebody kidnapped us, and they asked for a ransom, somebody pays that ransom, and delivers or rescues us from the clutches of the enemy that is called redemption that's what Jesus did he play, paid that price with his blood with his life and redeemed us from this horrible pit that you can see in that picture he pulled us out and washed us as it says in this verse he washed us with his blood and set my feet upon a rock and then they sang this new song. What is the song that they sang? And that's the chorus of the verse, a song we sang earlier. 
uh, down in verse 13. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits on the throne. This is a new song that it says in Psalm 40. That he put a new song in my mouth. And this is a song that the redeemed of God will say. Mahato nyano behumanom shakti. Be unto our God forever and ever. This is a call to mission. This is what Jesus saw when he saw the multitude because that was the harvest that he saw before him. That he is going to fill this multitude in Revelation with the sheep that were scattered. And he had compassion on them because he yearned for them to be part of this multitude. And as our country is so divided today that you know, we can't even talk to each other. But look at what it says here. That multitude is filled with every tongue, every tribe, every nation. We're not called to preach to Malayalis. We're not called to preach to Indians. We're called to preach to every nation, every tongue, every language, every skin color in this world. There is no difference. God, Jesus' blood can wash every skin color from the stain of sin. There is no difference. We have backed ourselves into a corner that we protect our culture so much at the expense of the gospel. Let's come out of that. Step forward out of that and love everybody and have compassion as Jesus did and ask ourselves, are we bold enough to answer the call of missions today? Are we bold enough to not just give but to go? And as you put up that last screen, who will go for us? Who will go for us? This is what God asked Isaiah. And what was Isaiah's answer? Here am I, Lord. Send me. He didn't say, I will give so somebody else can go. He said, send me. Who is willing to answer that call when Jesus is asking, who will go for us? May his name be glorified.